My name is Kirk O'Donnell and I'm president of the uh, Center for National Policy. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming this morning to the Center's Public Policy Symposium, Trading on the Future. We're here on uh, Super Tuesday morning, a day of uh, 20 state voting, an exercise that uh, Southern lawmakers may decide should not be repeated after today. Preven pre uh, preventing the repetition of October 19th does not lend itself to such clear-cut decision-making by federal lawmakers. So we're here today to discuss various recommendations for change in security markets, the relationships in security markets, and their regulatory framework. We hope that this symposium will further enlighten the debate on this timely issue that originated with the Brady Commission study of the causes of the October stock market crash. The Center will continue to sponsor such forums as this and provide the opportunity for discussions of national and international concern. If you're not currently on our mailing list, we would like to receive future notifications. Please fill out the cards provided on your chairs and tables and turn them in on your way out today. You will also find on your tables white cards that you may use to write questions for our panelists. These will be collected by center staff and brought to the moderator. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. <coughs> Sitting at the second chair to my left is the Honorable John Dingle of Min Michigan. The <coughs> representative is the distinguished and widely respected chairman of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and he is a major influence in shaping policy in the areas of energy, health, consumer and environmental protection, communications, and the regulation of securities and financial markets. Sitting to Chairman Dingell's left is James Stone, the president of Plymouth Rock Assurance Corporation. He is the former ins state insurance commissioner in Massachusetts, appointed by Governor Dukakis. He served as a member and chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Sitting to Jim Stone's left is Stanley Shopcorn. He is vice chairman of Solomon Brothers and is in charge of all domestic and international equity trading, sales, and arbitrage. He is a member of the firm's board of directors and he has been at Solomon since 1973. Sitting to his left is Myra R. Drucker. She is Director of Trust Investment for International Paper Company, where she is responsible for managing the firm's pension fund. Recently, she was appointed to the Department of Labor's ERISA Advisory Council and to the Pension Managers Advisory Committee to the New York Stock Exchange. Our moderator this morning, sitting first to my left, is Sandra Van Oker, senior correspondent for ABC News and anchor of ABC News Business World, the first regularly scheduled weekly business program on network television. Sandra is a veteran reporter who has been covering national and international beats since 1958. Sander, the program's yours. Thank you very much, Kirk. Um, my qualifications um, for being here is that I've covered business for two years, politics and international affairs for about 30. And I must say in the two years I've been covering business and especially Wall Street, I've learned that when I ask a question on Wall Street and someone says, I don't know, I feel like Diogenes wandering the streets of Athens looking for an honest man. I found my honest man. <laughs> The panel this morning will have five to seven minutes apiece, and uh, questions will be received. If you will write them out on cards, the center staff will pick them up as uh, the proceedings go along. 
and then I will sort them out and direct them to whoever the question is directed, or if it's not to an individual, I'll pick the individual. I will start first with um, the gentleman on my left, who if you listen to television and you read newspapers, you will know that John is not his first name. That's not really his first name. His first name is Powerful, as in Powerful John Dingle. I will introduce Powerful John Dingle. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you all. The market and the financial situation in the United States have been changing rather startlingly. The events of last October 19 tends to point out that there are some things going on that do need the attention of the country. My dad and the others who wrote the Securities Acts of 33 and 34 had hoped that they had achieved a termination of the great panics and the great economic swings which took place. And a great deal of attention to the Congress in the 30s was spent to seeing to it that a crash along the lines of 1929 did not occur again. Many of us have had studies made over the years with regard to what it is that is going on and what should be done to assure again that the stability of the marketplaces remain intact. I don't want to appear to before you as one who advocates that there should not be swings in the marketplace, there should not be rises and falls, that money should not be made, and money should not be lost. The market is supposed to do just those things. The big question with regard to the market is whether or not the market will be a device which will maintain the confidence of the American people, and whether it will serve the basic function and purpose which is so essential to the United States, and that is to see to it that we have a capital formation mechanism which will assure that this nation will be able to grow, to fund its economic activity, to provide a mechanism for investment, and yes, to provide a measure of financial return to people who enter that marketplace. The function of federal regulation in the marketplace is rather peculiar in the sense of federal regulation. It is not there to see to it that the marketplace and those who participated in, in securities is regulated the way the banks are, the way the railroads were, or airlines are, or anyone else. It is simply to see that the truth is told, that fraud is held to a minimum, and that public confidence is maintained. That I think is a very important thing to note. One of the things that we observe from the 19th of October is that public confidence is a very fragile thing as I've had the occasion to observe to many people who function in the marketplace, the market does not run on money. It runs on confidence. And if it is uh, of such character that it maintains that confidence, then it produces enormous wealth and lots of money for lots of people and for lots of important purposes. The studies that have been made of the marketplace on following the 19th of October are interesting. In my view, the best is that which was made by the Brady Commission. In my view, the worst is that which was made by CFTC. Both of them have defects, and perhaps we ought to take a look at them. The study made by Brady is perhaps the best chron chronology and history of the events which occurred, and makes it very plain that the events which transpired uh, were of, of very serious character and that real difficulty probably was avoided only by one very interesting circumstance, and that was that the mechanical functioning of the market failed, and that the wonderful new technology of computers simply could not carry out the function. Had these events not been so, God alone knows where the market might have gone. The SEC ran another rather good study. It ran one which gave a pretty good technical analysis and came forward with some rather useful recommendations. The CFTC study said essentially everything is just fine, let's trust everybody, let's trust the situation, and let us allow matters to go forward as they have before. There were a number of technical suggestions made by each. One of the things which, which appears to be common to many is that in some way there has been a breakdown between the regulation by CFTC and the regulation by the SEC, and that there are huge gaps there which create cracks through which much falls, which should in fact not. One of the other things which is common is that there appears to be need for something which will arch over this whole business. 
Instability seems to be pointed out in the factual representations made in each of these studies, stemming in good part from the difference in the regulatory philosophy. Many of you are aware of my concern about the behavior of CFTC and the fact that it has a history and a philosophy which tends to identify it with, with the sale of pork bellies futures and soybean futures and not with the real need to protect the public confidence in the marketplace. Indeed, I have seen studies which indicate that one in nine persons entering into the CFTC regulated marketplaces is regularly skinned. This is, of course, very good if you are interested in hedging and things of that kind. It is less good if you are interested in rock-solid public confidence in a marketplace into which honest men may feel they may enter to trade without great peril to themselves and to their economic well-being. The Congress has been studying these recommendations. We will be starting on the efforts to try and craft solutions to the problems that exist here. As all of you know that questions relative to Glass-Steagall and its amendment or repeal are before the Congress. Other questions with regard to mergers and activities uh, will be, have to be dealt with by the Congress. In addition to this, questions relative to the behavior internally with regard to the Securities Exchange Commission regulated market itself, whether the market is functioning as it should, whether it is doing what it should, and whether those, both the self-regulatory organizations and the member firms as well as the employees of the members' firms are carrying out what it is they should. All of these are questions which will have to, go, have to be carried forward. One of the sad things I note is that as history has taken us further from October 19, the interest in doing what should be done in terms not of regulating the market, not in terms of eliminating the swings of the marketplace, but simply in terms of maintaining public confidence to eliminate excessive volatility and the risk that can be associated with that from the standpoint of the American economy have not been taken and that the public does not appear to have the same concerns about addressing those difficulties which they had on the morning of October 20. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stone? For reasons of time, I will not repeat the case that I made repeatedly when I was down here about uh, there being too much speculation in the markets or that an excess of speculation in the markets is bad for the economy. There are numerous speeches and testimonies and articles I left behind on those subjects. Uh, and besides, I think I've been begun recently to look like a moderate because a lot of other people have been saying the same thing and maybe it's even become evident that those things are true. Warren Buffett, a man that I respect very much, wrote, we do not need more people gambling in non-essential instruments nor brokers who encourage them to do so. And I doubt that he's even changed his mind after becoming Solomon Brothers' largest shareholder. He recommended a 100% tax on short-term speculative gains. Bob Kirby of Capital Guardian Trust Company has called for a boycott of firms that do computerized program trading that also manage customer funds. And even John Shadd, with whom I frequently disagreed when he was down here as SEC chairman, has recently said that the leverage and volatility of the markets has uh, been raised by derivative instrument speculation to precipitous and disastrous levels. So I'm going to just sort of take as a given that there's a danger from too much speculation. Uh, I think that the case has really become very, very obvious. And I'd like to use my few minutes to talk about why things have gotten that way and what we ought to do about it. With respect to why things have gotten that way, part of the problem is intellectual. That is, there's been a conceptual error in the way people have looked at markets and what the goals we're trying to accomplish are. One of the pieces of that error is that there's been a sort of mad chase for something called liquidity. Liquidity is probably a good thing, but the word is used many different ways by many different people. And unfortunately, the thing that's been chased is liquidity meaning only market breadth, that is lots and lots of volume. Lots and lots of volume, if that's what you mean by liquidity, is not particularly valuable. Liquidity meaning market depth is valuable. We don't have any of that, and that isn't what we've chased. 
breadth is what we've got. Efficiency is a second thing that people have been chasing. And we should keep in mind that our capital markets are probably the most efficient capital markets in the world. I should even take out the probably. Our capital markets are the most efficient capital markets in the world. They're very, very good at allocating capital, a lot better than any bureaucracy is. Chasing that extra bit of efficiency that comes in some complicated arbitrage calculation is not a particularly worthwhile goal, adding a tiny fraction of a percent of efficiency to something that's already extremely efficient is not worth all of the costs and all of the side effects we brought into the system by it. And lastly, there's been a great deal of talk about needing to have risk shifting. Anyone who thinks you can shift the risk of being long the entire amount of equities in the United States is wrong. You can shift a little risk in uh, holding grain in storehouses. You simply cannot shift to anybody the risk of the equities markets. It just isn't, isn't possible. So we've ended up, I think, chasing some sort of false concepts, but like many, many things done in the United States, we've done it very, very well. We've put some of our smartest people into it. We've set up a huge industry, and uh, it's just terrific at doing these things that aren't particularly worthwhile and have some, some terrible side effects. What we need to be chasing is not more depth, uh, excuse me, more breadth in the market, it's more depth. What we need to be chasing is not uh, that last bit of efficiency or an elusive sort of risk shifting. It's long-term capital formation. That's the goal and the legitimate goal of the market, and we don't do anywhere near as good a job at chasing that. Now, everybody, I think, would say there's a legitimate role for government policy in shaping what we do there. Margin policy and tax policy in particular are the two strongest tools that government has available, and they're the accepted means for moderating speculation in a free economy. If you doubt that either of them can be effective, just mention either margining or taxation to a, a lobbyist who works for any of the financial industries, and you'll see that uh, you get a strong reaction. These are very, very powerful and important tools. We haven't used them very well, and we really ought to. We ought to be using both margin policy and tax policy to favor longer holding periods for fundamental capital formation kinds of investments and not anything else. Now, if, uh, if that's where we, we are now, um, why hasn't government acted? Well, I suspect that government hasn't acted in part because there's been an intellectual confusion, as I mentioned a moment ago, but in part because there is a tremendous amount of money available for political contributions to keep things the way they are. That is, unfortunately, a part of our system, and it is particularly true in areas that involve such huge amounts of fast-flowing money. Now, I have a lot of faith in our system. I think it will change. I think that uh, what's happened in October is the beginning of something that is going to bring about a change there, but it isn't easy. If you doubt that money and the political process have had that kind of influence, I'd say ask anybody more than a mile from where we're sitting, and they'll tell you there's too much speculation in the markets and something needs to be done about it. It's really only here that there's any doubt of that. I was very surprised when I spent my four years in Washington to learn that as soon as you leave here, everybody agrees, but here, very hard to make the point there's too much speculation in the markets. So, what do we do? First, get our thoughts clear. Let me just give you a couple of conceptual statements. First, remember there's only one market. There isn't a market in Chicago and a market in New York. There isn't a futures market and a stock market is something different. There's just one market. That's the most important concept to keep in mind, and it's got to be regulated consistently. Secondly, speed of transactions is not a virtue in itself. If it helps accomplish long-term capital formation, it's good. If it interferes with it, it's bad. And third, that the only way you get useful capital formation, the only way you get the market to do its job, is through fundamental research and long-holding period investments. Anything that helps that is good. Anything that doesn't is probably a, a waste of time. What do we do to change it? Well, I would say, uh, there's a lot that needs to be done, but a really good starting point would be the Brady Commission report. The Brady Commission report is really quite good and reasonable, and it makes 
one heck of a good starting point for changing the things that need to be changed here. But I would add to it that you need to take a very serious look again at tax policy. We have now a tax policy that does not favor long-term capital formation investments, and we ought to take another, another look at that. We got off really easy, frankly, on October 19th. There wasn't a tremendous amount of structural damage done to the economy, apparently. We didn't know it at the time, but it looks as though the economy survived it. And the market's virtually back up to where it was before. I think we'll all be damn fools if we don't take the warning we got so cheaply that time and wait until the next one, which just has to be worse. Thank you. Uh, Stanley Shopcorn. Good morning. <clears throat> the events of October 19, 1987, and the market sell-off of January 8, 1988, were as painful for Solomon Brothers as for other market participants. We are not here to lay blame on any particular segment of the industry or on any participant. The problems we face are structural and are not the result of any specific market activity. It is necessary to address these problems to maintain investor confidence. As events before and after October 19th of last year demonstrated, the markets have changed dramatically. The major studies of that crash reveal that the complex markets of today pose difficult challenges to legislators, investors, regulators, and everyone involved in financial markets throughout the world. I think it is important to begin with a historic perspective on block trading, portfolio trading, and other marketplace realities. In the 20 years since I have entered this industry, volume has grown dramatically. Commissions have declined, the roles of market participants have changed, and options and futures markets have added a new and very important dimension. The 1960s saw the end of the historic role of the individual investor as the dominant factor in the equity market. The evolution of the institutional investor created a demand to trade large blocks of stocks in the 60s and 70s, and today a demand for so-called portfolio trading. In a world of unfixed commissions, the market price impact of these larger transactions has become greater, particularly during periods of market stress. The pressures of money management have created an era of creativity and experimentation in new trading strategies and tactics, including portfolio trading. Block trading had been accomplished through an ad hoc joint venture of the specialists and the block trading firms. The capital and distribution abilities of the block trading firms augmented the specialist system. Block trading was a response to institutional demand for less market impact and the prompt execution of orders. Block trading worked effectively because fundamental, value-oriented investors were invited to participate. The opportunity to take or liquidate a large position in a market clearing transaction had wide appeal. In the late 60s and early 70s, there was considerable discomfort with block trading, very similar to the unease currently surrounding portfolio trading. At present, a growing number of equity market investors have begun to recognize the importance of low-cost executions to asset allocation strategies. In addition to the demand for block trading, demand for portfolio trading now exists. Some of this demand was created by Congress in the early 1970s with the passage of ERISA and the subsequent increased pressure on pension fund managers. The financial futures markets and index option markets were created in part to serve the demand for portfolio trading. Because of the cost considerations of moving an entire portfolio or parts thereof, it is no longer sufficient to buy or sell shares in a single company. Large institutional investors, particularly those with passive or indexing orientation, cannot lower trading costs enough with conventional block trading. These inv investors want to trade whole lists of stocks. Unfortunately, structural problems exist in the stock market system. The capital and distribution network that enabled block trading to succeed cannot accommodate portfolio trading today. The same demands for liquidity that were made on the specialists and block trading houses in the 60s and 70s are now being made on the specialists alone. Specialists are ill-equipped to trade portfolios. The specialist does not want to provide portfolio liquidity, and in fact, no one expects him to do so. 
What is needed now is a mechanism to bring the capital and distribution abilities of the block, hate, of the block trading houses to bear on the problem of trading and distributing portfolios of stocks. Furthermore, the index options and futures markets must be more fully integrated with the stock market. The intersection of the new institutional trading strategies and these new derivative trading markets has important implications for institutional investors, investment banks, and the behavior of market prices throughout the world. Internal pension staffs and external money managers can use index futures and options for most allocation decisions as devices to implement timing decisions or to hedge various investment strategies. Currently, futures trading of pension funds and other large institutional owners is only part of the futures trading that takes place. Investors of all kinds use these markets to hedge market risk and to increase or decrease market exposure efficiently. Fixed income and equity derivative index instruments have grown dramatically because of the ability to implement various investment strategies at substantial cost savings. These market changes have occurred in an unstable world environment that has created more volatile markets. Portfolio insurance and other asset allocation strategies were created and used in an environment of perceived liquidity. However, the October 19th collapse demonstrated that the low commission rate environment of the 1980s creates less liquidity than a five-year bull run in the market would have indicated. Commission returns today are used to cover the high costs associated with full and complete service. There is little excess to return to the system to increase liquidity. This is not a complaint, it's a reality. In 1973, a specialist for floor brokerage commissions accounted for most of his profit margin. By 1983, two-thirds of the specialist profit came from trading income rather than floor brokerage. The specialist reliance on trading income is probably at least as high today. We believe that the auction market system or central marketplace is the best market. As a step toward an even more effective market, we support the principle behind proposals to increase the capital and distribution ability of the market system. The required capital of specialists has not been revised since 1977 when it was decreased. The market system needs well-capitalized intermediaries. We are prepared to do our part. On October 20th, Solomon and a few other large firms stood behind the specialists and the marketplace in many openings and reopenings throughout the day. We also believe that major steps must be taken to increase the flow of market information so that fundamental investors can feel comfortable participating in the market without fear that a major asset allocation or portfolio insurance transaction will surprise them. We need to find a way to keep the fundamental investor in the market. The growth of value-oriented asset allocation strategies can offset the destabilizing effects of the dynamic hedging portfolio insurance. Reform is clearly needed, and generally we agree with the recommendations of the Brady Commission. Specifically, we believe that one agency should coordinate inter-exchange cooperation. We believe that it is essential that this be done as soon as possible. No single exchange can develop an integrated approach to the whole market. A unified credit and clearing system is imperative. Margin requirements should be reviewed and harmonized. This does not mean that they should be uniform in all markets. We do not believe that trading on margin had much to do with October 19th. Circuit breakers should be developed, but not abused. Free access to the marketplace draws investment to this country from around the world. This confidence should not be jeopardized. Intermarket and intramarket information systems must be improved. In conclusion, I would like to leave you with four specific proposals. These are critically important steps toward preventing unnecessary market instability. They will also ensure this country's capital raising mechanism and strengthen our role in global trading activities in the 1990s. Our specific proposals are the following. First, set up a mechanism to cross or advertise portfolios. Crossing portfolios would encourage more participation from value-oriented fundamental investors. Portfolio trading 
would then become the block trading of the late 1980s and 90s. Secondly, permit the crossing of blocks of futures contracts at a single price in the same manner that blocks of stocks are crossed. This reform will help accomplish the integration of the securities and futures market, which the Brady Commission and others have advocated. Third, eliminate option position limits to allow better pricing and cost analysis of hedging activities and to allocate risk appropriately among market participants. This change, as much as any other, should prevent a recurrence of market instability from dynamic hedging portfolio insurance. Fourth, shut down the list feature of the DOT system until the system can be expanded and other structural changes can be made. This change, although less than optimal from the viewpoint of market efficiency, should silence many of the critics of stock index arbitrage. It would also dramatically slow the order flow and prevent the flooding of the system. Although, th although these proposals may seem somewhat technical, the changes are basic. We hope that these changes will reassure investors throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Myra Drucker. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I've just had my speech thrown out the window since most of it's been covered by one of the other panelists here. Let me um, tell you what I do and why I care about the financial markets and their workings in this country. I manage the investments for international paper companies' pension funds. I represent approximately 64,000 plan participants in doing this, and my job as named fiduciary and planned financial officer is to assure that the assets will be there to pay those 64,000 participants their promised pension benefits when they retire. I have another job too, and that is a responsibility to the tens of thousands of shareholders of international paper to provide, to pay for those pension promises in the most cost effective fashion. Basically, pension funds come from two sources. One, the corporation makes contributions in advance according to law under ERISA. Two, we invest those pre, uh, those advance contributions in the markets and to the extent that we can earn a good return on those investments, we decrease the need for the corporation to put in additional capital to fund the investments. Instead, our corporation can take that cash and can reinvest it um, in a way that will make our company more competitive in the markets worldwide in which we participate. So why do I care about the equity markets, the futures markets? I am perforce a big player in those markets. <coughs> the IP portfolio has approximately one billion dollars allocated to the equity markets. We do this after taking a very long and hard look at what our liabilities are likely to be over time and what kind of an investment policy will help us to meet those liabilities in the best fashion. That's our long-term policy mix and it equates to roughly a 60 to 70 percent exposure to the equity markets for the most part day in and day out. Now I say for the most part because there come times when the relative valuation of those markets gets excessive. And at those times, they are not frequent, but at those times, um, I want to get my participants, my fund, out of the way of those markets. I can just sell those stocks, but to do that is an extraordinarily expensive move for me. It's expensive on two counts. A, it go it's going to cost me about 2% of the total amount that I'm selling to, uh, in terms of both commission costs and market impact, which is, Stanley mentioned, is now <laughs> larger than commission costs to actually sell stocks. B, those stocks are being run for me by a carefully put together stable of external investment advisory organizations, each one of which has been selected for their particular expertise in finding good stocks in various segments of the markets. To go to those managers and say, you must sell equities, in effect ruins the careful structure that I've tried to put together to enhance my investment returns. So what do I do? I become a portfolio trader and I implement those trades in the futures markets, i.e. I say, fine managers, you select good stocks, let that value come through, but I am going to hedge the overall risk of being in the equities markets by selling short futures. We did that 
in um, September of 1987. The net result for my plan participants and my um, shareholders was a pension fund that returned over 21% in the, for the year 1987 in the face of a stock market that was up only 5% and a bond market that was up only 3%. I've s helped to secure the benefit promises to my employees and I've helped to do, uh, to do that in a fashion that's cost effective for the shareholders. So I care about the futures markets and I care about portfolio trading. I care about having deep, liquid markets in which to transact. I, I also care about the fact that some of the things that have been done as interim measures in the wake of October the 19th and, and as response to some of the, I think, frankly, um, irresponsible rhetoric that's been thrown around in the press have been potentially detrimental to my ability to use those markets in a, in a continuous fashion. Um, I am, in general, as, as everybody seems to be in agreement that the Brady Commission did an outstanding job, and I am, in general, a proponent of most of the Brady Commission recommendations. I worry about the circuit breaker recommendations. And I worry about the fact that both the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, in response to what I would call some irresponsible rhetoric, have imposed certain of their own circuit breaker mechanisms without heeding the overall message of the Brady Commission report, and that is we are one market. The stock exchange, the futures exchange, the options exchange, one market. The way the current circuit breaker mechanisms will work in the two markets is that effectively you can have one market halted, which would only cause selling pressure to cascade over into another market. I also fear that if we see the U.S. markets halted, that that business is simply going to cascade over into the foreign markets. There's nothing that prevents a U.S. investor from accomplishing a trade on any exchange in the world today, and there ought not to be. So I, I am clearly concerned on the circuit breaker issue. I would like to see, I, I agree completely with Stanley's notion that we ought to get that one agency in place coordinating the key issues as quickly as possible to prevent the kinds of discontinuous actions that each exchange has felt impelled to take. Um, I would also very much like to see some of the creativity of the people involved in our financial markets applied to opening up information to bring more participants into the trade. Again, Stanley gave a piece of my speech. I didn't know he was going to suggest that. But the fact is, on October the 19th, there were an awful lot of potential market participants who sat out the day because they didn't have information. They didn't know what was going to happen. They couldn't see what the real order flow was. Disseminating that kind of information, we've got essentially the systematic structure to capture that information and to disseminate it to all potential public market participants. The specialists, augmenting the specialist capital alone is not what you need. What you need to do is to bring in the natural other side of the trade from the value-oriented investors. Would that have prevented the market from falling? No because those value-oriented ori investors would have demanded a cheap price to enter the market. But they would have been there, and we would not have seen the discontinuities that ensued on October the 20th, I believe, had that system been in place. Um, finally, I guess, in conclusion, as a fiduciary, I'm investing funds on behalf of tens of thousands of plan participants and shareholders. It's vital to the interests of both that our capital markets be strong, healthy, liquid, and continuous. With the possible exception of those two notorious days in October, the U.S. capital markets have on balance provided precisely that sort of environment. As we go forward and consider ways to improve those markets, I would urge that any changes be approached cautiously with an eye to the impact of those changes on market liquidity and the competitive position of the U.S. in what are now global capital markets. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I stated at the outset, there are cards uh, which you can write questions on, and uh, 
We'll try to get through them as we can. As they're coming up, I'd just like to take the privilege of being moderator to ask one question, and I'd ask it of the chairman. Do we yet understand what role banks played on October 19th and the days following? The, Sandy, I don't believe the question of the role of the banks <coughs> has ever been really reviewed with, with care. It is pretty clear from the stories that I've seen that, that, that banks sort of froze up and liquidity was not made available until and after Mr. Greenspan communicated to the, to the banks that they had to make monies available to the marketplace to, su to supply the necessary <coughs> liquidity. There was, I think, at all times during the process, even after Mr. Greenspan's call, a noticeable and visible reluctance on the part of the banks to come forward with the necessary money. Your question is really a very good one. I don't think that the, that, the, that the particular matter with regard to bank and bank participation has been uh, reviewed. As a matter of fact, one of the interesting things is about the only recommendations relating to this that I've seen in any of the studies was the one which was made by um, the Brady Commission in which they said that the Fed should have an overarching responsibility to deal with the question of margins. It is clear that one massive problem, which was, which was clearly visible, was the liquidity problem, which seemed to afflict all parts of the, of the market, both in terms of futures, in terms of options, and in, in terms of the conventional types of securities. Uh, and, that, and that that problem was, uh, I think, that probably there was less a problem of lack of liquidity then there was the fact that, that, that the liquidity wasn't available and it probably helped avoid the kind of calamity that we could have worked up to had, had we really had a chance to let the, let the uh, market system carry forward the events of the 19th to the point where, the, where they could have reached. Thank you. Mr. Stone, explain please on what economic basis you can justify using the tax system to promote long-term capital investment. Why should the tax system not be neutral with regard to types of investment? <coughs> well, tax systems, I think, by their very nature, are, uh, are virtually never neutral. We always have in the tax code incentives for behavior. I don't think anyone's ever designed a tax code that comes close to having no incentives. And you know, it was always accepted for a very long period of time in the United States that the uh, uh, tax should be different depending on uh, what someone's holding period was. I always thought that was a sensible thing to do, and uh, I'm not sure where that good sense was lost, but I guess I'd like to go back to a system in which you pay attention to holding periods. I don't think that uh, neutrality in any abstract sense is either possible or desirable in a tax system. Uh, Mr. Sharpcorn. The Brady Report discussed the fact that the opening of the New York Stock Exchange, the ORS, opening automated report system, information is held privately by the specialist. Question, do you believe the specialist book should be open to all market participants at the opening? Second, would not making this information public enhance the trust and confidence that Chairman Dingle cites as vital to capital formation? I think that the order book at times, or maybe all the time, um, people should have equal access to it. I think that a very valid demonstration of that and something that we've talked about um, providing liquidity or providing the marketplace with something new was the old expiration system of the futures. Um, months ago, the old expiration system <coughs> excuse me, um, didn't allow for anybody to see what was going on. And the same articles that are written on portfolio insurance and program trading today were written on the expirations and that the market had wide swings in the last hour or two hours um, before expiration. By transferring the expiration from the closing to the opening and allowing the fundamental investor to see the advertisement of the on-balance stocks for sale or to buy made the fundamental investor participate 
in the expiration, which took the volatility out of the expiration and is now an acceptable circumstance. So that is, and I think a major part of what I've said today and has been said to a great degree on the panel was let the fundamental investor in to see the flow of what is going on and he can make the decision. If that is what takes the fundamental investor to see what is going on by seeing the book, I would support it. Uh, Mr. Trucker, do you agree with Mr. Shopcorn's fourth recommendation, which would shut down the list feature on the DOT system? Would this not break the link of index arbitrage and diminish your ability to provide a hedge for your pensioners? Yes, it would. And frankly, of all Stanley's recommendations, that is the one that I have the most problem with. Um, it is vital to my use of the futures markets that those uh, that stock index futures and the cash market for stocks be very closely linked and index arbitrage in fact does provide that close linkage. Um, I would be, I would say that any idea of shutting down the list feature of the DOT system ought to be examined awfully carefully in that regard before it's done. Um, Chairman Dingell, do you expect the recent passage of corporate anti-takeover legislations in Delaware, where such a large number of U.S. corporations call home, would prompt some sort of federal preemption, preemption of state laws regarding corporate takeovers. Is Boone Pickens here this morning? <laughs> I'll hand it to you. He's not. Maybe Carl Icahn is. <laughs> <laughs> the hard fact of the matter is that uh, the, there's been an enormous shift in the past couple of years on the philosophy of what ought to be done by the corporate managers with regard to takeovers, mergers, acquisitions, particularly hostile and unfriendly ones. The consensus originally was that the federal government had to do something. The Indiana case tended to show that uh, at least to the uh, managers and, and, and uh, corporate officers that perhaps this matter ought to be dealt with on the state level. I personally uh, think that the Delaware case is, uh, rather the Delaware statute, is probably just an extension of what happened <coughs> in Indiana, and probably the two are going to be tied together as the courts review this question. It's my personal private feeling, and I, I will utter it today, uh, not for the first time, but for one of the first times, and that is that, that probably the courts are going to chew on this question some more, and I would suspect that when they get done, that it may be that the attitude of corporate managers will shift back to the idea that something should be done in Washington because I think that there's, there will be severe questions of constitutionality and other things with regard to uh, the actions that have been taken in, for example, Delaware, Indiana, and, and other state legislators. So I would anticipate that probably, at least for the time being, there will, the pressure for legislation in this area on the federal level will be vented off significantly. But I would anticipate that the issue will be back. I'm not one, by the way, who believes we ought to do away with one share, one vote, nor am I one who believes that basic uh, uh, corporate democracy or the right of a shareholder, regardless of who he might be and whatever his name might be or whether he's hostile raider or just a, just a friend of the corporate management, should be changed so that he does not have the right to exercise reasonable ownership prerogatives over those shares. Uh, Mr. Shopcorn. Is intermarket front-running a problem? What should be done about it? I think that intermarket front-running um, can be a problem. Um, I think any time that anyone can or does take in advantage of precise information he has to create a profit, it's wrong. Um, I think that there has not been um, any regulation or any uh, direct res regulation out of any particular exchange. I, it is supposedly covered under the business, <coughs> it is now said today that it is covered under the business ethics practice um, uh, and rules of the exchange. There is an option, there is a straight out option rule that says you cannot front run in options. There should be a s straight out rule that says you cannot front run in futures. Uh, this is addressed to Stone and Drucker. Um, why do you persist in saying there's one market when in the advance in communications have provided time differentials in trading which appear to set up market potentials around the world which can take advantage of these time changes? Who would like to go first? Well, that makes it even more one market in effect. We have a 24-hour global continuous market and I have spoken with um, representatives of, of New York Stock Exchange firms who have told me how they passed the book in their business from uh, 
New York to London to Tokyo, and I may have gotten the order wrong, but it was something like that. Um, all of these markets are one market. I think that that presents a particular challenge to both our Congress and our federal regulators and our self-regulatory organizations as we look at ways to change our system because we cannot forget that the global markets are out there. The folks in London are just waiting in anticipation of our doing something to drive trading offshore and into their welcoming arms. And we can never forget that if we want to maintain a competitive stance in, in the financial industry. Um, we have to proceed with great caution in terms of what kinds of regulations we take, precisely because it is one market. I'd concur with the first part of that answer and then differ with the second part. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the fact that we do have that internationalization all the more does speak to the fact that there's just one market. If looked at in economist terms, supply and demand terms, um, there's really only one market for the supply and for the demand of claims on corporate assets. And what form on paper uh, that takes and what expression it has is really less important than the fact that the supply and demand are all talking about the same thing, the claims on corporate assets. So I do think that there's one market. And uh, um, more and more, we're going to have to harmonize our regulatory structures and policy to recognize that. But I disagree about uh, the business going overseas. I think that has been a somewhat overestimated threat. I think that uh, our markets are the, the biggest and, and broadest and most successful in the world. And they're that way in part because they're sensibly regulated and relatively stable. Um, you can be pretty sure you're going to get your money if you enter into a trade in the United States, and you're less sure in some other places. I think that our performance in October was better than many other countries, and I think that if we uh, um, can, over time, regulate our markets in a way that even enhances confidence in those markets and stability in those markets, we get more of the business and not less. Following up on that answer, I'd like to address this to the chairman. Is it fair to say that all the studies described what happened in October, but didn't explain why it happened? How do you reconcile the idea of efficient capital markets with a 30% drop in the value of the market in less than two weeks? I'm not sure that the amount of rise or fall that occurs in the market indicates that the market is efficient or in inefficient. And I would have to say that, that uh, I think that there are two criteria here that we have to address. One is the question of efficiency, and the other is the, is the question of orderliness. Uh, I can conceive of, within limits, a market which would be enormously efficient and also very, very disorderly. I can conceive of, a, of an orderly market that would be extremely inefficient, and I think everyone here can do that. I'm troubled about how we get the balance that is needed to see to it that we have both an efficient market and an orderly market. And our system of regulation, at least to this date, I think all of us would agree has been one which has produced public confidence, which has uh, seen to it that although volatility could be present, at least that uh, there, there could be a sufficient level of trust. The studies did not address this, and one of the things that's rather noteworthy about the conclusions is that, rather about these studies, is that, that, that in some instances, as in the Brady or the SEC study or the GAO study, they were excellent in terms of a narrative and a history of the events that occurred. In the, and they also uh, were, were rather good in coming up with general, generally good, but politically tempered recommendations in which they recommended things which they felt could generally be accomplished. There was very little daring and innovation in that, and I would suspect that that tended to indicate one of the reasons that they did not address the question that you mentioned, Sandy, and that is what caused this thing. That, that is something I think could get you an awful lot more fight than it really would be useful uh, to get in the minds of the makers of these studies. Let me follow that up and ask uh, <coughs> Mr. Shopcorn. It was said, as a matter of fact, I put the question to Chairman Rostenkowski on October 18th, that the tax proposals then are ways and means, now it's out, about making takeovers and green mail to fight takeovers less attractive from a tax point of view, uh, helped precipitate the events of October 19th. Did it have any effect at all? Yes, it did. 
um, the, the marketplace, for a variety of reasons, was overboiled, overboiled and overvalued, both on a historic basis and on the fact that people for five years had known that each time a market went down, it would come back, so it would be very easy to put your money in and know that if you held on, things were going to go well. Um, there was a tremendous, amount, a tremendous amount of performance of fundamental investment managers during that period of time had come from merger and arbitrage to take over because it had been active just like it's extremely active today. Once you frightened that investor and said, hey, you know, there's no easy pickings anymore, um, and that's not Boone pickings, um, um, it made things rather difficult. I think that was one of the three or four um, catalysts that set the market down. Uh, this to you, uh, Mr. Stone, as a former chairman of a regulatory agency. Mr. Sharpcorn stated the Brady Commission recommendation that all regulation be centralized in one agency. What are the feelings of the other panelists to this, and which agency would they advocate? I'll start with you. I think that uh, financial regulation, particularly of the securities markets, is, uh, is much too spread out and that uh, there does need to be at least a harmonization of regulation and coordination, and maybe we need to go all the way to a single agency. We have to be careful not to lose the advantages of specialized expertise that we have in the kind of more spread out system there is now. On the other hand, uh, um, I, I guess the Brady Commission report, I'd say, is a minimum for where we ought to, to go in terms of coordination. Sandy, excuse me, I, I did not say, and if it was implied, I apologize, that there should be one agency. Um, my concern is, is that f for the present, in order to promote inter-exchange cooperation, because no one exchange will set up any regulation that might hurt itself alone, that in order to put this thing together,